All right, I'd like to call to order the regular business meeting of the uh, District 128 Board of Education for Tuesday, March 22nd to order. If we could all rise, please, and say the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, roll call please. Okay, so we note for the record Marsha Overrider and Judy Sugarman are both absent tonight. Uh, Alan, if I could, could I appoint you as secretary? Uh, tonight in uh, Okay, our agenda this morning or this after this evening, um, we will have uh, two educational presentations: one on social norms and health wellness, a uh, brief president's report, an update from our two student school board representatives, uh, superintendent's report. Uh, we'll then invite anybody from the public who would like to speak. Uh, I would remind anybody from the public who would like to speak tonight, please state your name and address for the record, and we would ask you to limit your comments to three minutes. I would also remind you that we will listen to your comments but not respond um, as part of that session. Uh, we'll then uh, review and approve the consent vote agenda. We'll have updates from the Program and Personnel and Facilities and Finance Committees. Um, there really is no Property Committee update. Uh, Special Education District of Lake County will have an update. Illinois Association of School Boards will then move into an executive session. Uh, we do anticipate taking action after that executive session and then any other business. Okay, anything else? All right, our two educational presentations. Yes, good evening. Um, tonight we have our first presentation, which will be on social norms. Every year we usually hear an update from the committee at Vernon Hills High School. And this evening I'd like to introduce Erin um, Art from the Lake County, Education, uh, Lake County Health Department, as well as Madeline Powell and Doug Gustamer, um, two of our VHHS staff, to update us. And you all have some information at your seats today, which is courtesy of the Social Norms Committee. So, Doug? Thank you. Uh, thanks to the board for having us tonight. The uh, purpose here is to talk about the social norms campaign that exists in the school. Uh, first, to define it, the social norms campaign is, uh, is a campaign that does kind of the opposite of what the media does. It focuses on what the norm is. Um, most of our information comes in the form that we focus on, on the exceptions of what, um, of what is talked about here, maybe the parties that kids go to. This focuses on what most kids do most of the time. Next slide, please. What this shows from the last uh, three years of, um, of research, of surveys that we've done, is that the kids here at Vernon Hills really do make healthy choices. Um, you can see the increase in the um, perception of, of who's free of drugs and alcohol. We know through a few years of doing surveys now and gathering all of our data and going through the research that we're doing something right here. There's something very remarkable going on. And we've been hearing about this from the various researchers that we work with, just how remarkable the situation is here at this school and how lots of schools are very envious of the situation here. Uh, we have learned that not only do the majority of the students here believe our messages on the posters and on the um, letters from the letters from the Royal Flush washroom newsletter that we put out every uh, a couple times every semester is always a hit but they also are remembering it and saying that it's believable we've been able through our data analysis to find a correlation between the percentage of students who have seen campaign materials increase over the years so has the percentage of students who report being alcohol free in the past 30 days so we're seeing our materials being viewed more and we're also seeing you skip less which is exactly what a campaign would like to see. Students also who report having seen the campaign messages more frequently report less use. And so students who have seen the messages eight or more times, according to the survey, 
report even less use than students who had seen it from one to seven times. Usually people ask us, what's with 30 days? Why do we only talk about 30 days? We generally talk about that because it's known to be the best indicator of use and of non-use likewise. Um, historically, because we ask our students not just did you drink, yes or no, we ask them on how many occasions did they drink. So I know just like being an adult, I can't remember what goes on past 30 days. Sometimes I can't remember what's going on last week. And so we expect kind of the same from our students that way. And so we only really ask them about the last 30 days to be the most accurate picture. Okay, this is kind of a new slide for us. We presented to the school board quite a few times on this sort of information, but we're actually gonna delve a little bit into what about the students who do use alcohol? Because we're not, you know, we're very aware of the fact that there is still a group that is using. While our numbers are getting better and better, there's still a small group that's using. So out of the entire student body, we had 235 students that said that they had had alcohol on at least one day in the past month. Out of that, 184 said that they had it on one to five days, and 51 on six or more. In talking with our researchers, all the students who reported from one to five days use can technically be considered infrequent users. We prefer them to be non-users completely, but they can be considered infrequent users through the spectrum of the, of the research that we follow. There is still this group of 51 that we're worried about. And that's really one of the challenges that we've had faced to us is, you know, what can we do to this particular group of students? How can we work differently to affect them? So that's one of the things that's coming up in the social norms campaign. So when you really look at the picture, we have about two classrooms of students who we're very, very concerned about. Something nice that we've been able to see this year because we have been collecting data for quite a long time is that all four grades have really increased their alcohol-free numbers. So we, just from top to bottom, the green line being freshmen, the bottom line being seniors. We've had a huge increase in alcohol-free juniors and seniors, which is something that is not the norm. That's something that's very exciting, and some of the researchers have noticed that, wow, you've had a huge impact with the older age group rather than the younger age group, which is generally the one that's expected to make an impact with. Just so you know, students all across Lake County take part in the Illinois Youth Survey every other year. And so this next little bit is a little bit about how, you, how Vernon Hills compares to the county. We can compare it on the 10th and 12th grade levels. 10th grade for the county, 70% had used alcohol zero days in the past month. So 70% reported being alcohol free for 10th graders. At Vernon Hills here, it's 81%. In 12th grade for the county, 52% of seniors across the county reported being alcohol free in the past month. And here at Vernon Hills, it's 71. So that's quite a remarkable difference between the county and Vernon Hills, and so just to kind of frame the picture that we're dealing with here. Students who participate in activities also set the tone. We have here numbers that represent participation in athletics, performing arts, and school clubs. Uh, also show a high percentage and an increased percentage of non-use over the past survey, um, the past survey dates. There's also an, um, what they call an injunctive norm. On the survey, the question was asked, do you think that drinking, underage drinking is wrong? 66% of the kids said they strongly disagree or agree, I'm sorry, thinking that there's nothing wrong drinking. So they thought it was wrong to drink basically 66% of the time. And they also believed 44% of the time that other people believe this, the same as them. Just as with Doug talking about the injunctive norms, the descriptive norms that talk about their actual behavior influences their behavior as well. And so not only do we have more students saying, I think it's wrong to drink, we have more students saying, I think you think it's wrong to drink, and I think you think it's wrong to drink, which is influencing their behavior into a more positive manner. So this chart here really illustrates a perfect case example of a social norms campaign that's going down the correct route. Um, this slide is one of the reasons researchers are so super interested in this school to know what's going on here, basically, because there are other schools who've been doing campaigns who might not be able to replicate these type of results. 
And so this is a very exciting, exciting thing. We have their perception changing the pos in the right direction. Students are believing that less and less students are using. And also there, the number of alcohol-free students here is getting better and better. Okay, so what's next for the campaign? We've been going for a little while now. It's natural to wonder what's coming up next. This has been going for some time. Um, really, how can we work differently with students who still drink? That's really one of the things that we need to, to go on to next. It's this, this, some, this group that we're trying to identify, um, we might be asking faculty and staff for their input on some of these students as well. How can we reach out to them in a better way and things like that. Um, we've been encouraged to explore different publishing options, and so that's something we'll be talking about with administration very shortly. Um, we have researchers asking us to please, please publish this because there is not a lot of research um, in the field of high school social norms. There is a lot on college social norms. And so we would like to kind of hopefully push Vernon Hills into the national forefront of this um, as a great example of something that's working. Okay, just to wrap it all up here. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really couldn't do it without you. Administration and the positive groups of students that we work here really help set the tone for a fantastic campaign. This is one of my favorite projects that I do across all the many projects for my job. Um, someday, hopefully, I'll have an office here, Ellen, right? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you have one already. She says it all the time, but it's never come through. <laughs> We, um, these are just some of the, these are the names of the committee members here at the school who work very diligently year round on the campaign, even sometimes through the summer. So um, actually at your table you have a PowerPoint presentation that is more full than this one. The one that you have with all the notes was presented to um, faculty and staff about a year, week and a half ago. And so you have lots and lots of information in there that we didn't have time to share tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Erin and Doug and Madeline for uh, updating us this evening and for all the work you've put in over the last, past few years on this project. Next we have our Health and Wellness Committee from Vernon Hills and at this time I'd like to introduce Cheryl Steffens, Nora McKiernan, and Mike Mullaney. Good evening everyone and it's a real pleasure to be here to share with you some of the activities and progress that we've made in health and wellness over the last four years. Um, my committee members, Mike Mullaney and Nora McKiernan, are passing out just a little thank you for letting us be here tonight. And you may be wondering, why is health and wellness passing out M&Ms to the board members? Shouldn't they be against candy? And in fact, uh, we do have a little statement to make about M&Ms, it's kind of uh, a theme that runs through the presentation. So feel free to enjoy. Go ahead and open them if you so wish. However, the very last comment of our presentation will give you a little bit of interesting information about the m and So you may prefer to wait until then. OK. Here at Vernon Hills High School, we do have a school improvement uh, uh, goal that has to do with health and wellness. and. The goal for Vernon Hills High School is that students at Vernon Hills High School will demonstrate higher achievement by improving the quality of their health and wellness. Over the last four years, we've chosen four different focus, uh, nine, sorry, different areas of focus, uh, fatigue, fitness, the need for sleep, nutrition, obesity, exercise, stress, also the food choices available here at school, and our newest addition is mental and emotional health. So those are our nine focus areas. We're only going to talk about a couple of them tonight with the hope that we will be invited back in the future to address the others. For exercise and fitness, the uh, PowerPoint shows you some of the programs that we have done. Our pride and joy over the last four years is the uh, formation of our FitLinks room. And Mike Mullaney, who will tell you about that, was a key figure in Vernon Hills High School having this wonderful fit, uh, FitLinks room. Mike. Thank you. Uh, the exercise and fitness component of the health and wellness program basically consists of two parts. One, our FitLinks room that has 25 cardiovascular pieces of equipment and eight strength pieces of equipment. 
Uh, these pieces of equipment are hooked up to the FitLink system, which allows us to monitor and track participation in the room, as well as an online component that allows us to per per uh, track participation uh, outside the room uh, on your own. Uh, right now we're going to show you the, the workings of the FitLinks room. Uh, students come in and put in their ID number that allows this to be individualized. They select the workout, and in this case we're going to take the intermediate strength program. There's other programs that can be chosen. Uh, some information is given, uh, and we log in. We go to what's called a training partner. This allows individual instruction for everybody that takes the, uh, the program on the left. Weight is identified, number of sets and reps, the last workout, and the target of 12 to 15 repetitions. On the right, the range of motion is monitored, time of lift and release, number of, of repetitions, and only when is it, it, the repetition is done correctly will this count the repetition. Uh, the program consists of eight strength pieces, uh, starting from large muscle groups, going to smaller muscle groups, you can see that the student is going through a very controlled repetition. We can choose speeds that would increase this repetition speed or decrease the repetition speed. We go from uh, leg exercises to chest exercises. Uh, this is the chest press to a shoulder exercise, a, a seated military press working the deltoids, uh, a lat pull working the back and biceps, and then we'll end up with a, a curl exercise and then one that's not uh, seen would be a tricep exercise. When the student's done, they again log in to get their ID number, uh, and they will get some information at the end of the, of the program, which would indicate how many pounds that student has lifted in that particular uh, day's activities. And all of that information is logged into the FitLinks uh, database, and we can draw out all kinds of reports individually for students, as well as classes uh, and larger groups. Uh, as of November, uh, student FitLinks data that we have, we have 99 students that have accumulated 15,000 points, and one student has actually accumulated 125,000 points, and since November that's also uh, increased significantly. Our faculty component of the health and wellness, uh, we've had seven members at 15,000 points and two members at over 300,000 points. Uh, this consists of any types of uh, health-related exercise done on their own. Uh, a fun fact, in February, students and faculty burned over 3 million calories, compiled almost 400,000 minutes of cardiovascular exercise, and lifted 2 million pounds uh, in some type of body weight or free weight exercise. Uh, our latest addition to our health and wellness exercise component is participants in our district office. Uh, we have regular users, they've joined our regular users group after school, and 15 of the department of district office employees competed in the 2010 Coast to Coast competition, which is a part of the health and wellness program. I'll just briefly point out that the mascot for this particular team happens to be the M&M machine at the district office. <laughs> One of the first programs that we started with four years ago is the Cougar Climb to Fitness program. It's a faculty program. We thought that in order for our students to get on board with health and wellness, what we wanted to do was model for them that our staff really cared not only about themselves, but also about our students' health and wellness. So we started with this program. And in this program, our faculty had to keep track of what they do for health and wellness. They have to monitor it, record it. It's really quite task, uh, time consuming. And uh, then they're rewarded. As they reach all of the different benchmarks for their points, they're given uh, different rewards. Most of them have to do with attire. Uh, one of the shirts you are seeing the three of us wear today. Uh, the Coast to Coast Fitness Challenge was then introduced where we encouraged our students to participate along with staff uh, for health and wellness. And what they had to do was put together teams of five and exercise, bike, run, do some sort of fitness activity. Those activities would then be translated into miles. And as you saw in the previous slide, the map, um, over the five weeks between Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, they had, we kept track and we monitored the progress across our country, state to state, going along good old Route 66. 
And we did have winners, but all of the participants in the Coast to Coast were uh, recognized and given an award. Uh, this particular year, Jim Pardun's team, Kingdom of Fitness, happened to be our uh, winning team. We also had a winning team at the district office, the good old ladies of the district team. Uh, we're very proud of the two annual events that we've had, the Community Classic, the 5K Classic. Uh, in 2009, our first 5K Classic, we were able to raise and donate $1,800 to the American Heart Association. We were able to top that last year with a contribution of almost $4,000 to the Glaucoma Research Foundation. And our third event will be coming up again in October. We hope many of you will join us. We can almost call it the International 5K. I don't know if you can notice the woman on the right, but she's actually a participant who came to our event from Russia. Okay, so she used our event as a little warmer upper for the Chicago Marathon, but she was there and uh, she hopes to come back again. We're talking about nutrition and obesity is Nora McKiernan. Okay, we looked at um, some overall changes to make here at the school, and one of them was looking at our vending machines and the options or the choices that we put in there for the students to make healthier choices. And we had a panel of staff and some students on it. We looked at the nutrition value of what we were offering, the fat content, the sugar content, and so what we did is we traded out some of those choices for healthier choices going to like baked chips or trail mixes or granola bars and that sort of thing. We still do offer some candy in there for the ones with the sweet tooth, but not as many options. So, And then our next thing was is the beverage. Um, and what happened was is our beverage company came to us and said the Beverage Association came to them and said that they wanted to do something before they were mandated by the federal law to make some choices about um, health, the health healthy choices for the beverages. So what they told us is we needed to offer more bottled, bottled water, we needed to offer low calorie drinks, and anything like Gatorade or the sugar drinks had to be, the serving size had to be loose, uh, lowered to, from 20 ounces to 12 ounces. And then we have a regular soda machine, but during the day it is turned off and it goes on after the school hours. So that's, um, and that was, we were guided by the beverage companies, not by our choices. And then we also offer some nutritional signs, working with the chart wells and the vending machines, just the nutritional, value, uh, um, nutritional facts of what we offer here at the school. Thank you. Uh, our other popular programs for nutrition and obesity are our lunch and learn presentations. We have brought in nutritionists uh, twice over the past four years. Next year we hope to bring in a personal trainer to deal with um, how best to reduce your BMI. Our healthy soup days are very popular. The next one is actually Thursday, so hopefully uh, some of you will come over for our healthy soup day. Our biggest loser competition comes to an end on Friday. We'll see who that person is who uh, made the biggest change in their BMI. And we uh, will continue to be working with chart walls regarding the selections that we offer here at school. I'm nearing the end of the presentation. I wanted to end with a little bit of information about after doing all of these things and getting all of the support that we get from our administration, is there any impact? Is anyone benefiting from all of these programs? And I have several different statements by faculty members, staff members, ESP members. I'm going to ask um, Mike to read one statement and Nora to read one statement just so you can hear from are the people we are serving, uh, how this is going. This is from a Cougar student. For me, the Coast to Coast Challenge was more than a workout. It was fun. Trying to reach a goal is much easier in a group of friends where you have a great source of motivation. Completing the challenge increased my awareness of how much time I put towards physical fitness every week. And since then, I've de developed more di discipline, better time management, and even a better muscular endurance. There is a better satisfaction than being rewarded for your hard work. If I weren't a senior, I would be doing it again next year, definitely. 
Okay, and this one is from one of our district uh, secretaries. I would like to thank you for helping us at the district office get involved in the VHHS Coast to Coast Business Challenge. Now that I've completed three weeks of the six week challenge, I feel better overall and am motivated to exercise more. In the short time, I notice that I sleep better at night, I think about what I eat and do I really want and need it, and the best part is that I inspired my husband to get up off the couch and walk with me in the evenings. These nightly walks have become a habit of, uh, for us and we enjoy them. I look forward to continuing this challenge as my personal challenge so that I can get in better shape and maybe even motivate others. So just a couple of statements I'll flip through to the end here. Um, if you remember, the whole goal for our health and wellness committee is um, not only to promote health and wellness, but to actually see some student achievement. And I'd like to show you some in interesting data. Um, each year we get data from our spring PSAE tests. And if we look at last year's data, um, students who did not meet either reading or math standards, their fitness score, which is a score of zero to 10, averaged 7.0. If the, among the students that met one or the other, they met either math or reading, uh, their fitness scores, when averaged, came out to be 7.7. .7. But then when you took all of the students who met both of the standards, they did really well on the math and the reading uh, uh, standards, those scores averaged a 9.8. So does health and wellness make a difference? I think you can see that in, in that bit of data. We have a wonderful committee. Uh, uh, in fact, I have a list of people who are wanting to join the committee because it's such a dedicated, hardworking, and fun committee. Um, so I, I really am grateful to have uh, these people to work with. And my final food for thought about your M&M is that when you eat one M&M, in order to burn off those calories, you must walk the length of a football field. So you all have a package of M&Ms. You do the math. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for highlighting two wonderful programs. Can I ask one question related to health and fitness? Sure. Um, what is it? What are we still doing in the way of screening? Uh, for uh, health related things and, and I guess more specifically are we still doing the screening we did once before with the EKG and mm -hmm. yeah, okay. um, did we do it this year for at LHS yes. yeah we did it at LHS this year so I think we alternate schools every other year yeah. okay Next yeah, what, year. And what is the foundation that works with us again on that it's the Max Shevitz Foundation and um, they are working very hard to raise funds to be able to do this in every high school in Lake County. Yeah, I mean, I think again, with the, especially with some of the recent things that we've seen right. in the newspaper, I mean, what a great program. Just, you know, if you can save a single life as a result of something like that, I, mean, I personally think that's definitely something we want to continue to be promoting in whatever way we can. So thanks for all your hard work. Okay, um, I only have a couple of things. Uh, first, just a brief brain building update. As you know, over the last couple months, we have worked with the Brain Preservation Committee in the village of Libertyville um, with respect to extending the existing lease for the uh, Brain building. Uh, again, I want to acknowledge all the hard work of the people on the Brain Committee. Um, they're clearly very dedicated to making that project work. And I know they very much appreciate the support that we've given them uh, and the plans to extend the lease uh, per the terms we discussed in the last meeting. So the lease amendments have been drafted. Uh, they're with both attorneys for review, and we expect them to be completed and signed off shortly. Um, the other thing I'd just like to mention is really just to say thanks to everybody. Those of you who are here tonight, I know several of you participated in the legislative session we had last uh, week, which I understand was outstanding. Uh, I apologize that I was not able to make it. I would love to have been there. Uh, and I also would just like to recognize that I think a lot of the efforts that we undertook in the last month to really uh, get out and, and communicate to some of our local residents some of the key issues that are going on in Springfield and how they might affect schools, um, especially the issue with respect to school district consolidation. I think it was a great job. 
And I know I've heard in the community from a lot of people, if it wasn't for some of the things that we, we did and how we got the word out, that frankly they would have been uninformed. And so they very much appreciated the work that we did do so that they at least could um, understand uh, a number of the urgent matters that are going on. So thanks for all your hard work for that. Um, reports from our school board representatives. I know you're dying to get up there. So, uh, <laughs> we'd like to go well, good evening, everyone. Um, some of you may be looking at both of us and realizing that we're both from Vernon Hills High School. <laughs> well, this week, unfortunately, Hannah and Eric could not um, show up to the meeting. They couldn't make it. So I will actually, actually be filling in for Libertyville High School. And I just happened to wear my black in commemoration. <laughs> did you notice that, Dr. Scott? I did. He's got an orange band. Yes, <laughs> it's somewhere around here. <laughs> so as most of you know on the district, today marks our progress report number three, which means that we're just about halfway done with the semester. We're approaching the end of this year. And um, this week also marks our last week before spring break. So we have a lot of students at both Vernon Hills and Libertyville that I'm sure are very excited to either get away for a week or just hang out at their houses or whatever just to get away from school for a little while. And then once we come back, seniors will have to start getting ready for AP tests, some of them, so kind of waiting that. We also have winter sports awards actually just went on at both Vernon Hills and Libertyville and that marked a great winter sports season for Libertyville High School. Spring sports are obviously beginning and we have a great a bunch of great different sports teams at Libertyville High School that are going to continue on their success from last year. <laughs> last Friday jazz band had a great concert I heard and that marks that and Libertyville High School has their blood drive scheduled for April 7th. Student Council will also, also be organizing a dodgeball tournament to offset the cost of prom which is actually also coming up. I know for Vernon Hills it'll be May 15th, and Libertyville, I'm not sure on the date, but that's something to look forward to as well. Okay, um, some of the same things are happening at Vernon Hills High School. As Andrew said, it's spring breaks next week, so all the students are getting really excited. Um, one of our seniors, Moya Chen, actually got the John Benson Award, which was given in the North Suburban Math League in, in this area. Only two seniors out of the 58 high schools got this award because um, our, I think our math team advisors actually nominated her because of her passion for mathematics and her talent and she ended up receiving it which was great. We're really, really proud of her. Um, International Club um, yesterday and today they had a bake sale to raise funds for Japan. Also um, the past week the junior class student council also had a bake sale raising funds. Um, winter sports awards were last week so all the winter athletes were honored for their accomplishments and Mr. Curry actually said um, in the spring season I think we have almost a third of our student body participating in athletics so that's really awesome. Um, spring sports are well underway. Um, I know the boys water polo team hosted a tournament last weekend and there's also the girls had their first soccer game so as it's getting warmer, everyone's going outside more, getting more active. Um, FBLA is competing at the state competition this weekend in Decatur, Illinois. So that begins Friday and concludes on Saturday. And we have Mr. Cougar coming up on April 9th, the Saturday after spring break. So we have 10 senior guys who um, actually had an interview and they got in where they'll be showing a talent. We'll have some question and answer sessions. It's really fun and we're all getting really excited. So. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Okay, our superintendent's report, uh, Mr. Lee. Okay, good evening. As always, we have some great news to report about District 128, Libertyville and Vernon Hills High School this evening. The following students were named Libertyville High School February Students of the Month. Sarah Blackwell, Emma Kazian, Lindsay Williams, Jessica Apgar, Logan Reef, Patrick Bennett, Jason Lieb, Audrey Lobick, Megan Horbath, Case, Cassie Austin, Brandon Lococo, Jason Neal, and Mason O'Brien. The following Vernon Hills High School students were named March Cougar Class Act Award winners. Jenna Longombardi, Kurt Wickbull, Kelly Fernbach, Colleen Hare, Jessica Lawden, Karen Mari, Ramu, Sundararajan, Bradley Pearl, Andrew Wood, Anthony Petnon, Victor Blanton, David Zapeta and Nicholas 
uh, Lazerne. A paper written by VHHS science teacher Jay Walgren has been published in the January 2011 issue of The Physics Teacher. Mr. Walgren's article, Innovative Use of a Classroom Response System During Physics Lab, will be seen by over 10,000 teachers in colleges and high schools worldwide. Congratulations to LHS students Nathan Wolf and Elizabeth Ulandai for advancing to the second round of the Chemistry Olympiad testing. They will be taking the five-hour national test on April 16th. Congratulations to the LS, uh, LHS WISE team for its third place finish at the Illinois Academic Challenge sectional competition. Nina Andrave, uh, Andra, let's try that again. Nina Andravich received a third place medal in math. Matt King finished second in English and qualified for the state competition. Roger Michalides finished second in physics and qualified for state. And Mei Yang finished first in physics and qualified for state in both physics and chemistry. LHS placed fifth overall in the regional competition with all 15 students earning medals. The team is now preparing for the state competition held at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana on April 16th. And finally in the good news, VHHS student and DECA member Patrick Schupach has been awarded an Applegate Scholarship, the Leonard uh, Pokladek Memorial Award for $1,000. So congratulations to Patrick and that concludes the good news for this evening. As the board will note in their packets, there are two FOIA requests this month. And I have two uh, quick updates for the board this evening. Uh, one is an extension of uh, what President Grudy had mentioned earlier, but I um, want to delve a little bit more in detail on that. Uh, the District 128 Board and District Administration do want to thank our stakeholders for their support in opposing Governor Quinn's proposal and companion House and Senate legislation to consolidate 568 Illinois school districts without local voter approval. District 128 in our feeder districts, Oak Grove District 68, Libertyville District 70, Rondout District 72, and Hawthorne District 73 have taken a significant leadership role in opposing any school consolidation without local voter approval. Over 200 stakeholders attended and over 260 others watched a live feed of the recent District 128 Legislative Forum with State Representative Carol Senti regarding school consolidation and other public education issues. As a result of the dialogue with stakeholders, Representative Senti committed to oppose school consolidation legislation which does not include a mechanism for local voter approval. Although we are far from out of the woods yet on this issue, as a result of direct public pressure, House Bill 1886, which would have created countywide school districts, was not called in committee and is dead. And House Bill 1216, which could have resulted in significant school district consolidation in 10 weeks without local voter approval, has been significantly amended to slow down the timeline, to add educators to the commission studying the issue, and will now have a non-binding legislative vote on the commission's consolidation recommendations. One other bill, Senate Bill 2134, is of great concern at this point because the bill provides for politically appointed regional superintendents of schools to make final school consolidation recommendations within their area of geographic responsibilities. We will be watching the development of that bill closely. As such, it is critical and essential that our stakeholders continue to stay engaged in the legislative process regarding school consolidation, including contacting their state representatives and senators. Stakeholders can assess the, access the District 128 website at d128.org to learn more about current school consolidation legislation, to find their representatives and senators, and to learn how to contact their legislators regarding this important issue. And again, we want to thank the board for their leadership and our community to responding to uh, those very important issues. Second this evening, a concern was raised at the February Community uh, High School District 128 Board of Education meeting regarding an LHS science teacher referencing and or teaching creationism or intelligent design in a biology class or classes. The D128 and LHS administration looked into the concern and determined that an LHS science teacher had referenced and or taught creationism in biology classes. 
The D128 and LHS administrations dealt with the science teacher to ensure that creationism is no longer taught in those biology classes. Also reviewed and affirmed that creationism is not referenced or taught in other D128 science classes. And finally, clarified that the D128 expectation that creationism is not to be referenced or taught in any D128 science classes. The issue at hand is not, and I repeat not, whether referencing or teaching creationism in our science classes is acceptable and appropriate. It is not. The United States Supreme Court and several other federal court decisions have found that creationism may not be referenced or taught in public uh, school science classrooms. Regardless of our professional or personal opinions on this matter, there is no gray area in these court cases and District 128 must and will live within the boundaries of those court rulings. The teacher in question is a long-standing District 128 educator, cooperated fully with administrators looking into and, and resolving this concern, and the D128 administration will not be recommending his termination as this is remediable behavior. LHS and VHHS are two of the finest high schools in the country and the board, administrators, and teachers will continue to work with our stakeholders to build upon our legacy of excellence in this fine district. And that concludes the superintendent's report, President Grady. Okay, great, thank you very much. Okay, uh, I'd like to take this uh, rare opportunity to welcome everybody from the public. Um, it's been a really nice opportunity actually to showcase some of the programs that we have, uh, especially some of the programs that were presented at the, be at the beginning as well as uh, some of the recognition that we were able to do as part of our superintendent's report. So at this time, I would like to invite anybody from the public who would like to get up and speak. Uh, you're welcome to do so. Again, I would ask that you state your name and address for the record, and I would also ask that you limit your comments to three minutes or less, please. Good evening. My name is uh, Luke Wojciechowski. I live at could you turn the mic towards you? Thank you. Good evening. My name is Luke Wojciechowski, and I live at Gunner Anthony Avenue in Mundelein. Um, I graduated from Vernon Hills in 2005 with what I consider to be an excellent education. And I could come before you this evening as a concerned member of the community. I am worried that the personal agendas of certain individuals at this meeting to see creationism or intelligent design in science classrooms hold the potential to greatly cheapen the value of the great education that this district has been able to provide me, along with countless other students. I am under the impression that the school board is likely to vote in line with my opinions on this topic, and as a result, I will direct my comments to the individual supporting intelligent design as an appeal, you may even call it a plea to your objective reasoning. I could cite the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, the numerous legal precedents, the overwhelming support of the theory of evolution by the scientific community, the strengthening of uh, evidence in support of that theory as scientific knowledge has progressed, and the fact that intelligent design has been shown countless times to hold no scientific merit as arguments as to why we should abstain from allowing it into our science classrooms. However, I will not do that. Instead, I ask you to consider the potential consequences of what you ask in regards to our students, community, and country as a whole. Intelligent design was initially developed as a compromise between individuals' religious beliefs and what they believe the courts would allow them. It was founded on a negative argument. We can't explain it, therefore a designer of God. Supernatural causation is not considered scientific because there is no way to test it. It also fails to tell us anything about nature, what the designer did, when the designer did it, why the designer did it, how the designer did it, etc. The only thing that intelligent design objecti objectively provides us with is complacency. It, st it stifles the development of knowledge by allowing us allowing us to stop looking for answers to the unknown, consequently undermining the most important principle of science as a whole, the objective pursuit and discovery of that unknown. At this moment, our country is quickly losing its scientific prowess in respect to other nations of the world. We cannot afford to fall further behind. We should not be confusing our students with bad science. Imagine where our world would be if we taught alchemy along with chemistry, phrenology along with neurology, astrology along with astronomy, or if physics was explained in terms of God's will or magic, simply because we wanted to present our children with both sides of the argument. Don't get me wrong, I am 100% in support of teachers attempting to develop the critical thinking skills of our students. However, I cannot accept the infringement of the constitutional rights of our students by potentially having their grades hinge on their willingness or ability to argue 
in support of a religiously based pseudoscience, especially in a science class. Intelligent design is not the other side of the debate. It completely failed to take into consideration the creation myths of countless other belief systems and simply exists as a crutch which the religious cohort uses to reconcile any dissonance it may have with regards to modern science. If you have a problem with your children being taught evolution, it is your responsibility as a parent to present them with possible alternative explanations. We must stop this trend of parents abdicating their responsibilities and expecting a public figure to espouse their personal private religious beliefs. Teachers can only do so much and education is not restrained to a classroom. Why don't you use these issues as an opportunity to shrink that ever-growing gap between you and your children and reconnect with them? After all, this entire debate should be focused on that. Thank, Thank you. you very much. My name is Richard Valconet. I'm a minister in Grace Lake, Illinois. I live at 751 Penn Boulevard in Lindenhurst. I come here as a concerned citizen. I'm glad that the school board has uh, found no charges against the school teacher who was teaching creation. It's interesting that in 1925, in Dayton, Tennessee, there was a trial called the John T. Scopes trial, in which a school teacher was being brought before the court for teaching evolution. During that time, the ACLU attorneys made the comment that you Christians are a bunch of hypocrites and that you will not even allow us to teach evolution as an alternative. Today, the most up-to-date science are showing that evolution is really bankrupt. There is not one single evolutionary uh, transitional form. Scientists have laid out a $100,000 reward for anyone who can produce one and amazingly, they go silent. At College of Lace County, I have brought in physicists and biologists and willing to debate any professor at the college to see, can you bring forth any of this evidence? And lo and behold, silence. And as far as the Constitution, it is generally accepted, as the court says, that everyone believes in the separation of church and state. Interesting that anyone who reads the First Amendment finds out the words church, state, and separation are nowhere to be found but as a right, the people who founded our country said that we should not have the government establishing. Well, in 1961, in Supreme Court ruling to Roscoe and Watkins, uh, it was found that atheism was declared a religion. So basically what we are doing is saying we can't have Christianity because that's what the Bible teaches. And that shows us a form of creation, which, by the way, is irrefutable in science. No one can prove that Genesis 1 is wrong and it coincides with all of the evidence that we find, but that uh, the uh, evidence of what the First Amendment says is now being corrupted to where everyone believes that it says separation of church and state. Our founding fathers, and I encourage you to read a book called Original Intent. I'd be glad to supply copies for anyone who would like one. Read what history really says, not what the revisionists have told us. And if the school is supposed to be a foundation of truth, then how can we say we can seek truth here and here, but not there? I think it's very hypocritical for us to believe the revisionist historians, the bad scientists who continue to pr propagate a false science about evolution, which is shown to be untrue. And I congratulate the board for not doing any disciplinary action against the teacher and ask you to search for truth if that's what schools are all about. And I thank you. Thank you. My name is Matthew Yukas. Yeah, just pull it up a little bit, Matthew. There, right, thank you. Matthew Yukas. I live at 2061 West Buckley Road. Um, I'm a student at Libertyville High School, and I just like to point out that in his, in classes such as world history, which I'm currently taking, we've been taught different religions. We've even had tests on the facts and basic beliefs that we have of those religions. And that it all depends on the relevance to the situation, whether or not the teachers should be allowed to teach it. Obviously, Mr. Schaefer felt that it was relevant that people were taught intelligent design to understand as an alternate way of 
explaining the creation of life and whatnot. So, it's just, he felt it was relevant. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. President. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. President. My name is Rob Sherman, Box 7410, Buffalo Grove, 60089. Uh, many times when I bring concern to government, they duck and dodge and stall and evade. I brought a concern to you in behalf of a resident, in behalf of a student, brought a concern to you on a Monday night. And by Friday, the matter had been resolved. Four days it took to resolve this matter, and it was resolved courteously, professionally, uh, and uh, appropriately. Four days, that's uh, less time than it took. From what I understand, that's less time than it took uh, God to uh, create uh, the, uh, the universe. Uh, that took six days, so uh, you work faster than the uh, than that, that took six days, and of course, on the seventh day, God went to the uh, first Bears game featuring real bears. Uh, so, thank you for the fast uh, and prompt, uh, for uh, quickly and promptly addressing the concerns that uh, that I raised. I'm here tonight because I've heard from many parents during the past month. Half of them have asked, uh, have said to me that. Uh, uh, by email and by phone, that they're not going to rest until the teacher is fired. The other half has said to me, they not only don't want the teacher fired, they want creationism reinstated into the science curriculum. Yeah. Now, I heard every word that the superintendent said tonight, and I agree with every single word that he said, so I will encourage the parents on both sides to recognize the merits of what the superintendent said. Uh, there have been uh, suggestions in the newspapers that uh, uh, I want the teacher fired or that I'm here to, uh, have, uh, to ask for the teacher to be fired. I don't live in this district. I merely communicate a concern to you on behalf of a student. But I, since I don't live in the district, I don't take a position on whether or not the teacher should be retained or not. That's something that you have the expertise, the background, you know what the best practices are. Uh, the superintendent uh, made a presentation that is reasonable, that makes a lot of sense. So I will ask the parents on both sides, and the taxpayers on both sides, to recognize the merits of what the superintendent said and to uh, abide by and to support uh, uh, that uh, decision by the superintendent, by the board, uh, you've done an outstanding job. Uh, thank you for your prompt uh, uh, action on this matter. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to respond to them. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Duncan Millar. I live on Newbury Avenue in Libertyville and I'm the parent of two Libertyville High School students, one of which is in Mr. Schaefer's class. Um, I'd like to bring the whole discussion down to earth for a moment. What about the kids in that class who had to listen to the entire unit on evolution and be co-taught creationism? What are we gonna do for those kids to correct the message that they were taught? I mean, my daughter has been devastated by this. Our family has spent every day talking about this. It is an outrage that this teacher who has lost all effectiveness and all ability to teach is allowed to remain in the classroom. As far as the children are concerned in that class, nothing has happened. A teacher can violate their First Amendment rights, numerous, numerous codes of conduct by the State Board of Education and nothing happens. They're sitting there every day and just life goes on. So I urge the board to determine how can we help our children and to please move to remove this teacher. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name 
name is Dale Christensen. I live at uh, 1108 Tamarack. I did teach at uh, Libertyville a few years ago. What a privilege it is to, to come in regard to, to Bo Schaefer, bringing up the, the point of creation. You know, a school should be all about truth. What is truth? How many lies are still in the textbooks in regard to evolution? Still being taught that we know that we're out overt lies. To me, if you believe in evolution, you should welcome the opportunity to disprove creation. What was the order, the proper sequence that, that God created these things? Disprove them. What about time, space, and matter? Did they have the same beginning? Disprove these things. Check your, your fossil records. There should be a slow growth of insects and animals. If the evolution is true, put forth the evidence, verify it. You know, it should be easier, the, these mutations of changing from one species to another. Bring forth the evidence. You know, that's what st the school should be all about, you know, looking for the evidence, the facts. The schools, you know, unfortunately, we don't teach the history of the country correctly at all. I've seen our schools go from a being Christian. When I was in elementary school, we put on a Christmas program that was no different than at the, the church. We memorized scripture and we put it on publicly, in the public schools. It was a Christian school. Then I witnessed, when I got into teaching, I went, went witnessed the post-Christian era. And then I saw the end of it, the anti-Christian era. You know, what amazing transition our country has gone through. You know, because we haven't taught the correct English and history in our, in our uh, schools by any means. You check your history books. What have they left out in regard to the great history of the spirituality of this country? I'll leave you with just two quotes. Patrick Henry, I think most of you probably have heard of Patrick Henry. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not by, not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, peoples of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom to worship here. And the last one is uh, John Weatherspoon, who was a, a great educator. He was a clergyman, one of the first presidents of, of Princeton. If you check the history, why, why we have public schools, the colleges, when they were first created, were created to teach the scripture. That was the basic myth, McGuffey's Reader. When did we give up McGuffey's Readers in, in our nation? What was in McGuffey's readers. You know, Weatherspoon was a famous educator, clergyman, president of Princeton, signer of the Declaration of Independence. He taught a president, a vice president, three Supreme Court justices, 10 cabinet members, 12 governors, 39 representatives, and numerous delegates. Needless to say, his philosophy in teaching all these men had a profound effect on the establishment of this country. And here's what he said. If your cause is just, if your principles are pure, if your conduct is prudent, you need not fear the multitude of opposing hosts. What follows this? That it is, that he is the best friend of American liberty, who is the most sincere and active in promoting true and undefiled religion, and who sets himself with greatest firmness to bear down on profanity, immorality of every kind. Whoever is an avowed enemy of God, I scruple not. I do not hesitate to call him an enemy of this country. That's where our country begins. I thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else?
Okay. Hi, my name is uh, Erica Egan. I live on 33 South California Avenue. Um, I'm a student at Mundelein High School, and I just heard about this tonight, a couple hours ago, when my sister posted this on, fa this on Facebook, because she wanted to know, you know, what the deal is, what the context is. And from what I understand, it's about a teacher who's teaching or who has referenced creationism in a biology class. And as biology being a science, we never, you know, we think of like, oh, you know, what are cells doing? How is everything going? And from the way that I see it, as a student who goes to high school, I want to get everything that I can out of everything, out of every single one of my classes, because it's a lot cheaper than when I'm going to go to college and I'm going to end up fifty thousand dollars in debt afterwards. And so, the way I see it, you know, evolution is a theory. All kinds of religions are theories, and you know, we never think of some supreme being above us who has created anything. We never think of them being a scientific. We never think of God as like, oh, when he created the world, does he think that gravity was going to be a constant of this? Did he think that acceleration would equal force divided by mass? We never think of something like that. But that's not to say that science isn't only created when we discover something that's true. We can't say that Thomas Edison, up until he discovered how to make the light bulb, that what he was doing wasn't science. Science is about creating experiments to find and to make sure and to prove that your theory is right. You know, right now they're doing experiments about the God particle, which I believe is something they hypothesize is inside of us that makes us believe in religion. Because religion has been around for centuries and hundreds of thousands of years. And so, as far as biology goes, you know, we never think of, oh, God planned um, cells to divide and multiply and so they would have nucleuses and they would have meiotic um, processes. But just because we haven't talked about it before doesn't mean that we shouldn't now. You know, I want to get as much as I can and I'm learning creationism and comparing it and contrasting to evolution. I see that as okay because I see it as both plausible things. And as a religion, it's a, big, it's a big thing that high schoolers consider, especially as we are in high school and we understand a lot more of the concepts that are involved instead of just understanding that, oh, um, Moses parted the Red Sea to help his people escape from Egypt. We understand a lot more of the things. And so as we go throughout high school and we go throughout college, we need this basic understanding and we need the found as many foundations as we can get on a bunch of different ideas so we can gain our own independence on this. So if, we're if we are comparing biology and creationism in biology, I think that's okay because they can both go together. You know, saying creationism, you can't mix creationism and biology is like saying you can't mix chemistry and physics. You know, they're, they're connected. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? All right. Uh, thank you again to everybody for their comments. Oh. Okay. Lisa Ann Lombardo, and I live at 922 North Milwaukee Avenue. Um, I'm a parent of a student at Vernon Hills, but we do live in Libertyville. Um, I just wanted to say that I wasn't really sure where you were at in this whole situation when I heard about it today, and I wanted to thank you for the decision that you made. I feel that you made exactly the right decision. So um, uh, the fact that you're, you know, I, I, I'm an atheist, and I'm, I do not believe that religion or religious views should be taught in the classroom. And I feel that any time that's taken away from the students learning science, unless of course it's a religious education class, um, but in science I believe that religious views should not be part of the education. So I'm glad that you made that decision. But on the more human side, I think that it's also good that you made the decision you know, not to fire this teacher. And I don't know the teacher. I really don't know much about the situation beyond what I've heard here tonight. But if, um, if a teacher can be guided um, in order to follow the rules of the school, then I think that that's what you should do. You know, I always believe that you should do what you can in order to help people move in the right direction. And as a teacher, I'm sure he's done you know, a lot that's good for our students, but you, uh, another gentleman here mentioned the fact that the students themselves have lost out on education because they're being taught creationism during the science classroom when they should have been taught 
science curriculum. So I think that that's a valid point as well. So if there's a way that you know we can make that up to the students to help them fill in the gaps of what they were missing, I think that that should be looked at as well. So all in all, I think the decision that you've made is good, but I think that you can do some additional things to sort of you know tie up the loops for those children, and I hope that you look at doing that. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. And just to clarify a, a few <coughs> points. Um, one, you've heard the uh, comment from Mr. Lee, which obviously stands, uh, and the administration has made a recommendation uh, on this matter. We will be reviewing that recommendation in executive session tonight, um, so I just want to clarify that an, a an actual decision has not been reached with respect to uh, at least the personnel aspect of it. Um, so uh, we will, we do expect that we will be taking action following the executive session tonight, okay? My name is Kenneth Eigelberger. I live at 17704 West Stone Manor Drive, Grays Lake, Illinois. I'm also a taxpayer in Libertyville in that I own a commercial building at 131 West Park. <clears throat> I didn't think I would be able to find any uh, agreement with Mr. Sherman tonight, but I find that I am in agreement with him in commending the administration for resolving this issue in a very quick and forthright manner. That's probably the only thing I agree with Mr. Sherman on, however. I, uh, while I do commend the administration, I would also encourage them to seriously consider intelligent design and creationism as a as a part of the science curricula. As many other people have addressed the board and the administration tonight in suggesting that it is reasonable that both points of view be presented, I believe that that is the right thing to consider. You are in the business of educating the students. The students will certainly find many more controversial issues if they go on to higher education as we just saw very recently at Northwestern some very strange things that they're teaching in colleges these days and so I think to consider both points of view in a science class is entirely reasonable and I would encourage you as educators to look at that and consider that in your deliberations. At some point in time in our country, our forefathers saw that it was not only reasonable but appropriate to put on our currency, in God we trust. And so they must have recognized that there is a God, otherwise it was a fairy tale that they were putting on our currency. And I don't think that was their intent at all. So I would encourage you to consider both points of view and to consider teaching that in the science curriculum. And again, I thank you for a very quick decision regarding uh, Mr. Shaker's uh, position with the district. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else? Okay, thank you everyone for your input. Uh, we'll now move on to the rest of the agenda. Uh, the consent vote agenda is listed on the agenda was reviewed in committee. If I could ask for a motion to approve the consent vote agenda as listed, please. I move to approve the well, thank you. consent vote agenda as uh, listed. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Arthur? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. Program and Personnel Committee update, Chairperson Maurer. Okay, we have a few things. Uh, first, we have uh, first reading of two board policies. Board policy 415, identity protection. Um, the identity protection policy is a new one, and it deals with the collection, storage, and disposal, disposal of social security numbers. Um, we reviewed that at our committee meeting. The second policy for first reading is 6150 Home and Hospital Instruction, and that has been modified to add in wording uh, regarding students who become pregnant and the type of instruction that they can receive both at home and in the hospital. Um, questions about that? Okay, then we'll put that uh, for next time for the consent agenda. 
Um, next, we have the annual staffing recommendations, and I'm assuming that everyone has had a chance to review the annual staffing recommendations. Um, were there any questions on those? Can I just summarize that? Because I mean, sure. I mean, the okay. two things that I noted obviously were enrollment in both uh, schools is up and actually up quite a bit. Um, but right. yet, overall, the uh, staffing has been held quite flat. So yes, uh, I can highlight um, uh, several things with this that I think are important uh, that uh, the board recognize, and more importantly, probably that our uh, stakeholders recognize. Um, as the board uh, has been aware, as part of a part of our long-range financial planning has been an effort to um, look at our efficiencies in all areas of our operation, including in the area of staffing. So one of the things that we've had conversation with the board uh, about over the past year, year and a half, um, was to look at uh, continuing to uh, uh, take a look at our class sizes and uh, gently, very gently, uh, raise the uh, level of our class sizes um, to a point that still kept us uh, at excellent class sizes, but allowed us to be a little bit more efficient to take some uh, advantages of uh, those staffing efficiencies. And uh, the staffing team has done that. Um, we take uh, our role in this area very seriously. It's about 80% of our uh, operating budget over the course of the year, and we spend four and a half days together in uh, first reviewing uh, student course requests and then uh, reviewing course offerings and class sizes, and then our needs driven by what our data has told us in our school improvement uh, planning, particularly in the area of uh, achievement and uh, our response to uh, intervention initiatives. And uh, as a result of that work this year, uh, we were able to gently raise our class sizes and in year-to-year -year comparative data, uh, save roughly $567,000 uh, from uh, this year's do using current uh, dollars from this year uh, to next year. That does not include lane and step movement. However, even when it includes lane and step movement, it still saves us $567,000 um, uh, over what we would uh, pay uh, next year once we make uh, those movements. Uh, the other thing that's important to note here is that we have been able to uh, take advantage of some of the retirements that we've had in the district to reallocate some of our staff particularly to areas uh, that uh, address the needs of our at-risk learners. Um, you will see uh, more co-teaching uh, in that model. Uh, you will see more movement of our staff uh, to service that group of kids that uh, may not be meeting or exceeding uh, state standards. And to us, that's a priority, and again, driven by our district strategic plan in, in uh, student achievement and also at the building level with our um, school improvement goals. And we're, we've been very uh, favorably impressed by the uh, progress that we've made in helping those uh, young people be more successful. So uh, that's one of the, uh, uh, that's clearly one of the areas that we look at when we go through the staffing process. So uh, the staffing team, and I do want to mention them publicly, is uh, Al Fleming, Associate Superintendent, Yasmin Dada, Assistant Superintendent for Finance, um, Deb Larson, Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, um, Ellen Swick and Marina Scott are two uh, building principals. John Gilliam, Associate Principal at Vernon Hills High School, Oli Stevens, Director of Student Services at Libertyville, and Kathleen Witt, Director of Special Education. So we did a, um, the group did a really fine job, I think, in balancing the needs of the district and taking advantage of some of the cost efficiencies of our retirement. So uh, we thank them for their work and we'll certainly answer any questions that you have. Does anyone have questions? Okay. Uh, I have one. Sure. Okay. So of the 13 individuals that we know are retiring and then the reallocation, what's the delta there? What? Delta? Well, 13 were coming out based on retirement. Mm -hmm. We are adding back and reallocating some of those. Right. So how many came back? So what's the difference between we're the 13 and the... Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you're looking for the, the total reduction right now, I would say um, the net of the programs listed is um, we're down 0.2. So we've, we have no 0.2 sections. So part of a teacher. But we've reallocated, as Prentice said, to you know, um, accommodate uh, other needs that we have and really helping those at risk learners. So 
And but there's a bigger savings because as those people retire, people will be hired in at a lesser level. So it's probably more than that. Probably, you know, if you take those dollars and turn them into FTE, we FTE, took the five hundred sixty-seven thousand dollars of everything turned in and used uh, an average beginning teacher salary in the neighborhood of fifty thousand dollars. That will give you the number of FTE in comparison that we actually saved. Um, again, so the public knows when 13 teachers retire at the top of the salary schedule, uh, what Deb is mentioning is we recoup some significant uh, savings when we bring a teacher in at $50,000 a year. So that $560,000, the, the number, the dollar number is actually more important uh, than uh, the staffing number, the number of sections, because that is the number that we will plug into the long range financial. Uh, plan. We don't plug an FTE into that model. We plug the dollar value into that model. So that's a number that we track every year and um, we're going to continue to track as we move forward and report that out to the board because at the end of the day, that's the number that really counts. I think what you're trying to, you know, if we had, a, we have to somewhat look at the department level. If someone retired in that department and then the department enrollment went down, which happened in some cases, you might not need to buy that whole new teacher, but some of that might have been reallocated for something else. So there'll be some differences when you get down to that level. And again, just to highlight, um, this was another year where we did not increase. We we used we used to right. use almost four hundred, right. five hundred thousand. Correct. Year Correct. Incremental as a result of the growth in the student enrollment. Is this the second, second or third year. year? Okay, so it's the second, second year, year that we've done that, totaling close to a million dollars a year saving Correct. if you compare it to where we were, say, two years ago. And I think, Pat, as, as you mentioned, and it's very important to note that um, our enrollment's up at both buildings and um, our staffing is you know, flat or down, um, and then obviously the dollar value savings. So uh, it was really a win-win in the staffing process. Uh, this year for the students in the district. And again, uh, the resulting class sizes are still very good uh, comparative uh, with our comparative districts, districts that we would compare ourselves with. So uh, again, principals did a great job at the building working with their department supervisors, uh, working with their teacher at the building to make uh, some of those decisions um, at the building level. So. Okay, so we're looking for a motion to approve the annual staffing recommendations. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Further discussion? Roll call, please. Nelly Pauly. Aye. Three. Aye. Monster. Aye. Mauer. Aye. Arthur. Aye. Okay. The next thing we next thing we have educational tour requests. We have two field trips listed. Um, looking for motion to approve those tour requests. So moved. Second. Second. All right. Any discussion? Just one question. Um, do we have any? Uh, well, it's not relevant to this, so go ahead. Sorry. Oh. Uh, roll call, please. Uh, three. Aye. Lunset. Aye. Mauer. Aye. Arthur. Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, we don't have any field trips planned to Japan this summer, do we? China. Well, and, and, and Pat, that's also a good point. If let's say if we did. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we had conversation with the board, and the decision at that point is we would uh, live within whatever recommendations that uh, the U.S. State Department was making, obviously using common sense as well and, and not putting our kids in harm way, harm's way. Uh, but if the State Department told us not to travel to an area and their alert was high, obviously the trip would be canceled, and, and we do make sure that the sponsors realize that. So that's an excellent point of clarification. Okay, then the last item on this agenda is the annual employment recommendations. So we're looking for an approval of the annual employment recommendations. You want to make a motion? I move to approve the annual employment recommendations. Okay, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Lundstedt? Aye. Maurer? Aye. Arthur? Aye. Deli Pauly? Aye. Rudy? Aye. This concludes the Program Personnel Committee report. Okay, Facilities and Finance Committee, um, Member Arthur. Uh, there is one item on tonight's agenda, but there is one additional. Uh, the one on the agenda shows that we will be opening bids for the uh, Libertyville High School concession stand on April 6th. And the second item, which came up as an other during our discussion that evening, uh, was that we will be looking at the 20-year capital plan 
uh, in the up and coming meetings in order to uh, take another look at that moving okay. forward. Okay, great. Anything else? That's it. Okay. Uh, property committee, no update other than what we mentioned on Brainerd this morning. Special Education District of Lake County, is there anything? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Illinois Association of School Boards, uh, no, uh, nothing to report. And uh, so I'd like to, uh, I'd like a motion to convene executive session. I'll make a motion that we convene executive session. Second. 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 Um, roll call. Uh, Aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. As I mentioned earlier, we do anticipate we will take action following the executive session tonight. Okay, I make a motion to approve and adopt a resolution authorizing a notice of remediation for staff member A, 2011. Second, please. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Aye. 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 Lundstedt? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. All right. All right, thank you very much. Uh, can I have a motion to uh, uh, adjourn. adjourn, please? I move to adjourn. I second. Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you very much, everybody. Mr. President, uh, is it uh, permissible to disclose uh, what the uh, thing of remediation consists of without necessarily saying who the employee may or may not be. Can you indicate uh, what the uh, uh, remediation consists of, or is that still a personnel matter? It's still a personnel matter, so we'd rather, rather keep that confidential. Uh, and, and do you care to indicate whether or not uh, th there will be a change in the number of uh, employees you currently have? I'd rather keep that confidential. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm so I just asked, would we, I, I don't know your still work procedure or personnel, would we